The most boring international break is finally over and we can get back to business. Premier League has never been so exciting at all levels of the table and as we come back into this match day, it is as you were. Every game is a massive six-pointer, it feels like, with everything at stake for almost every team. In the video today, we'll be doing all the score predictions for the Premier League games this weekend, as well as a little preview, a little look ahead to how the games might unfold at any point in the video today. If you laugh, you learn, you like something or whatever, please do like and subscribe to the channel. We're pushing for 10,000 subscribers and we can't do that without your support. So yeah, if you want to see more content on this, hit the subscribe button hit the like button and jump into the comment section and let me know your thoughts and feelings wherever the big game is for you this weekend what's the score going to be and let's just get stuck straight into it now the early kickoff on Saturday is Newcastle at home to West Ham and what is a massive six pointer for qualifying for the Europa League Europa Conference League, whatever it might be, the European spots in the league table. Now, Eddie Howe has had his apologists, has had his supporters all season. Everyone that can see the injury crisis, the fixture piling up, all the hurdles that have came Newcastle's way this season, that they've been smashing through and progressing through relatively well throughout the course of the season. But with 12 losses on the board, now is the time for that form to be arrested. Newcastle now need to put on a massive winning streak to maintain that hope, that dream that they had at the beginning of the season of being in amongst the top echelons of the table. But with David Moyes' West Ham coming to town, nothing is certain. West Ham have got that knack of getting results when no one really expects them to, even their own fans. Riding high at the moment in seventh in the table, going the course in the Europa League as well. David Moyes has been around the block often enough and he knows that Newcastle want to attack into space, want to counter attack. And I can see him coming to St James's Park with that style of football that boils the blood of West Ham fans to keep the scoreline tight and to allow West Ham to try and counter-attack into space on Newcastle who, at home, in possession of the ball, will be under pressure to come out, leave spaces exposed in an effort to go on and get the crucial points that they need, the victory that they need for themselves. No Sven Botman is another massive loss for Newcastle, but as far as Newcastle starting 11s go, this is not as weak as it's been. And with either Jacob Murphy or Almiron starting an attack, they've got their firepower, they've got their goal-scoring threat that Newcastle need to get the points in a game like this. When you look at this expected West Ham team with Thomas Suchek and Calvin Phillips in the engine room, it's all going to be about that pace of Caduce, Antonio and Bowen on the counter-attack with maybe the likes of Emerson and Kufal up in support if they do dominate the ball, they do get on possession for this. Because looking at that Newcastle midfield, the, the midfield battle might actually be won by West Ham. Lucas Paqueta versus Bruno Guimaraes is going to be an interesting battle. So at home, I'm always a big fan of Newcastle to get a goal or two. I just think the Jordi the home advantage and the style of football you know the route to goal that Anthony Gordon Alexander Isak can go for Newcastle are always dangerous to get a couple of goals very quickly the unfortunate thing for Newcastle has been the strength in their bench and how they've managed to maintain results throughout the game so they are going to need to start this game hot get their goals quickly I think two goals against West Ham is definitely on the menu but I do actually fear for that Newcastle defence in counter-attack because I do think this West Ham team having demolished Freiburg by five riding high in seventh position like I mentioned in the table is full of confidence, is fully armed and don't really have much going against them coming into this match. And this feels like a game that Hammers fans are going to be saying Moyes out at the end of down to the style of football. I think it's going to be a two-each draw. I think we're going to get a Desmond 2-2 here. But it may be one of those score lines where West Ham fans tell us it flatters West Ham and they were actually really bad. I would like to see Newcastle get the win here, but I just don't think they'll have quite enough on the day. It'll be a great early kickoff. Let me know your score prediction for this one. Tottenham and Luton have been two of the stories of the season in very different ways for achieving things that most people didn't give them any chance in hell of achieving at the beginning of the season. And as they face off in this game in the Premier League, it is firmly a six-pointer at both ends of the table. Luton, who are fighting off against relegation with some of their uh, competition maybe losing some points off the field maybe makes their job a bit easier they're just taking it one game at a time and just trying to get the job done on the pitch and much is the same for Ange Postacoglu's Tottenham Hotspur which finally now after the international breaks players returning from injury it's not quite a full strength team yet for Spurs but it's getting as close to full strength as it's been for a strong sustained period of the season Currently three points behind Villa who have got a huge game themselves this weekend and with a game in hand, Tottenham will be definitely looking at this game as being a massive three points for them and keeping that march on for finishing top four, just in case top five isn't quite Champions League.
And for looking like we mentioned, it is tight at the bottom. With a front three of Kulisevsky, Son and Brennan Johnson, this is pretty much as scary as Tottenham's been this year when you look at Madison, Benton, Kurt and Papasar in midfield as well. But it is in defence. We're going to see Dragas in the January signing get a start in this game alongside Christian Romero and first-choice fullbacks Pedro Porro and Vicario. Whereas with Luton, the team Hashioka's coming in now, but it doesn't seem too threatening for a Tottenham team with this amount of international quality, international talent. And the form and the attacking football that Tottenham have been threatening to play did it very well end of the season, but this kind of middle section has not really came. This feels like a great match where Luton are going to sit in nice and deep, give Tottenham the space they want in the middle of the pitch for the likes of Udogi and Pedro Porro and these other players to, walk, uh, to end up in these awkward positions and spaces that oppositions find it really difficult to contain them in. And I think this could be an amazing match for Tottenham. I really don't think Luton will score a goal in this one. I think Tottenham are going to get the clean sheet. I can see Tottenham getting a goal or two in the first half and making it really uncomfortable, really putting Luton under a lot of pressure. And I, I think Tottenham have got a really strong bench now. I can see this being 4-0. If Bournemouth have got any chance of finishing in the top 10, then this weekend, hosting Everton is a huge game where they need to get the three points to make sure that any hopes and aspirations are really overachieving this season. And that would be a real overachievement. It's still on the cards for the final furlong of the season because really there's nothing else for Bournemouth to be playing with. Very different for Everton, however. They are fighting off relegation. They're not even sure how many points they're going to have game to game, week to week, never mind come end of the season. So every game is a cup final for them. It looks to be essentially a full strength team here for Bournemouth. I don't know who you would put in on top of who's here already. I think there's maybe still one injury in defence, but very full strength midfield and attack, which is all you're after for these mid-level teams. They need to be able to score goals to win matches. And when it comes to Everton, Beto looks to start an attack over Calvert-Lewin. Calvert-Lewin still to be called upon maybe from the bench in this game. And it's all the work effort and energy in that midfield and defence. So I think this is going to be a game that probably doesn't have many goals in it, but probably has a lot of opportunities. I think it's going to be quite an open affair. Everton will be going for it. That'll give them, that'll give Bournemouth the space that they want to try and counter attack in and try and use the likes of Solanke and maybe even Ennis Unal from the bench. But like I mentioned, I don't think there's going to be a lot of goals in this game. I'm going to go for Bournemouth 1, Everton 1. A film of one of the most exciting teams for a neutral to watch this year. They've scored more goals than Man United and the only team in the bottom half of the table that scored more goals than them is Chelsea, who are in the bottom half of the table still. They go away to Sheffield United this weekend in a game that could be goals galore for Fulham as Sheffield United are still firmly circling the dream of inevitable doom and relegation. Sheffield United are still going to persist to play this Christmas tree formation that's getting them nowhere fast against a Fulham team that has been free-flowing, free-scoring very exciting with a lot of players getting in a lot of interest from around Europe. This is a team that has definitely been overlooked by a lot of people and are very dangerous. And this could be a game where Fulham take a lot of headlines on Saturday afternoon. Because it's at home, I do think yeah, Sheffield United have got a puncher's chance of a goal here. But Bernd Leno is a real hero of a keeper for me. So although I do think Sheffield will get a few shots away, maybe create a few opportunities, I don't think they're going to hit the back of the net. Whereas Fulham, I could see them hitting three, no problem at all. And it's just really, you know, how good are Fulham? How good are their players? Etc. Can they go on and score more than that? I'm not too sure. I'm going to go for Fulham 3, Chef United 0. Nottingham Forest have now firmly been dragged into the relegation battle and as they host Oliver Glasner's Crystal Palace this weekend, they've got a massive uphill task. They're playing a team who previously have been very defensive, very organised and very compact and are now playing under a manager that is the absolute opposite. I expect Crystal Palace to really come to this game on the front foot, looking to grab a win, look to earn a win, look to score their way to get in the win against a Nottingham Forest team who have the talent to attack, will look forward to a back and forth encounter with Crystal Palace, no two ways about it but will be treating this game like an absolute cup final they are third bottom in the table and with the points deductions that are coming and maybe still yet to come every point is a prisoner for Forest, and they are not going to be lying down for any team at all and when they see Crystal Palace come into the city ground it's definitely a game that the Forest players have got to be up for if not Forest do get relegated then it very much looks like they will this year this midfield Dominguez, Sangar, Calum Hudson, Adoy, Morgan Gibbs-White and Alanga will definitely find a future in the Premier League with another team, no two ways about it. All very strong, good athleticism, game intelligence, and ultimately just elite level footballers and in, the, in their individual positions. And this Crystal Palace team at the moment is getting its groove on. Eberichi Eze is fit and available. Wharton has been called into England youth teams. And this bag three, is, along with Munoz and Mitchell, has got a great balance in it to keep things tight as well as bomb up the pitch quickly, transition within a couple of passes, and look to find the likes of Mateta, Ayu, Eze, whoever, uh, in transition and counter-attack. This game for me is going to be end-to-end. -end. With Sam Johnson been out this game for Crystal Palace, they'll be calling upon Dean Henderson, who, well, you know, 
having a bit of an audition. He wants to be the number one goalkeeper there, but he's not been playing. He's been number two to Sam Johnson. So you've got to think that's an inferior choice there. So I do think Norton Forest are scoring in this game. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two. I'm undetermined on that. I don't think they can get as many as three. So I'm going to go for Norton Forest one, Crystal Palace two. I think Palace just edged this. Now, Chelsea are fast running out of excuses for why their season hasn't gone the way it should have gone. Currently sitting in 11th in the table at the moment. You've got to think they're going to get the job done against Burnley this weekend. Chelsea have scored 12 goals in the last four games, a solid three goal a game average, which is the sort of form that you would have expected from a team that has been so expensively composed and built. And when you look at the Burnley team, they are conceding that volume of goals on a regular basis. So it does feel like this could be a quite an easy game for Chelsea on the face of it. A Great game for their star players to pad their stats a bit, to notch up, you know, a few more goals, assists, key passes, highlights, whatever it is that motivates them on their way to securing three points against Burnley. I do think this could be a famous result for Chelsea that will give them a nice happy weekend to maybe give them a wee bit of faith, a wee bit of confidence to progress throughout the rest of the season that they will be hoping will also get them into the top half of the Premier League if results can go their way elsewhere. Uh, Chelsea do have, a, you know, in terms of attack, they do have options from the bench and that kind of thing. But as Burnley, I think I could see if a couple of goals went in quick enough, they might wilt and fade in this game. I'm going to go for Chelsea 5, Burnley 0. I did a full breakdown, a full preview and prediction of how I think Aston Villa v Wolves is going to shake out. But make no mistake about it, this has been the high, this is the highest stakes this derby has ever been. Both teams still fighting for European football. Well, Aston Villa hoping to maintain and hold on to the Champions League positions, whereas Wolves and Gary O'Neill are trying to fight their way into the Europa Conference League spots, maybe even the Europa League spots after you know, missing out on an FA Cup semi-final and maybe a very memorable cup run. But Gary O'Neill and Unai Emery, for me, are definite contenders for manager of the season. I don't think Gary O'Neill would win it. Maybe Unai Emery could. Because both managers have been doing an absolutely stellar job. Unai Emery and Aston Villa have had probably the most unheralded, the most unreported injury crisis of the season. And with the fixture pile-up and everything else that they've had competing, you know, midweeks and weekends, all season long, they have been excelling and exceeding expectations constantly but the exact same can be said for Wolves of course you think all the way back to pre-season Milopetegui leaving the transfer window was a nightmare Gary O'Neill coming in at the last minute and really Wolves have had the worst luck this year with VAR decisions and a few other you know injuries and other bits and pieces in between the worst worse than Villa worse than Newcastle Wolves have got such a thin squad anyway so even just like Neto being injured for a little bit is massive for them but coming into this game both teams have strengths it might expose each other's weaknesses as well and um, the first derby between these two uh, earlier this season was an absolute drag for me to watch it was a bit of a snooze fest it ended up finishing a draw there was some controversy some VAR and I think there'll be some of that flavoured into this game as well with it being half five on Saturday live on the TV the big kind of Saturday dinner time game as it were if you want to check out the full preview I did of the match I'll link that in the description of this video and at the end screen of this one so you can just jump in and catch that if you like but for me, this is going to be a game where Aston Villa are going to be in possession of the ball. They're at home. Wolves are going to be sitting back and camping in. And normally that's Aston Villa's strength. They want to control the middle of the pitch. They want to be on the ball. But with the injuries and absentees that they have, I actually think the Wolves central midfield might win that midfield battle this weekend. Which then puts a lot of the focus and a lot of the pressure into the wide areas. And both teams have got players that can damage each other. No problem at all. I think we're going to see some end-to-end -end football. We're definitely going to see some controversy in this one, whether it be from the on-pitch referee, the VAR decision. We might get a penalty, we might get a red card, but it's definitely not going to be dull. I think the benches for both teams are so thin right now that this game's probably going to be decided quite early on and will probably fizzle out towards the end with maybe one little spark of late drama. Aston Villa have been very formidable at scoring two or more, three or more goals this season and I can see them at home getting two goals, no problem at all, but they're not going to get a clean sheet. I think Wolves are going to get a goal in this one. I'm going to go for Aston Villa two, Wolves one. I said it before the international break, every time I back Man United to get a result, they let us down and every time I think they're going to drop the ball, they get the job done it seems and this weekend they're away to Brentford who are on an awful streak they cannot buy a point they cannot get a good turn to go their way at the moment so on the face of it Man United should be beating them here quite convincingly Brentford at home still are in good goal scoring form having Ivan Tony back definitely gives them a bit more threat a bit more teeth but since the 6th of December, Brentford have only won two games and having two draws. They are losing games all over the place. Man United, on the other hand, having lost the derby before the international break, were on a very good run of form. And this is a game that 
Eric Ten Hag's men will be looking at is thinking we need to be getting three points here to maintain this push to get into the European spots for next year and make this season somewhat successful for them. I'm always really impressed with the level that Brentford do operate at on the pitch. They've not been getting the results that generally their football and their style of play is merited. And I do think Law of Averages will pay in for Brentford at some point, but I'm not sure it's going to be this game here. They're definitely going to get a goal or two. And I do think they'll be able to limit Man United to very few opportunities in this game because Man United have not been amazingly creative. They've not been ripping teams apart or anything like that. And I think Brentford are well organised enough where Man United will really struggle to create opportunities in this game. They're always good for getting a goal, but I actually think Brentford are going to get the job done here, and I'm going to go for Brentford 2, Man United 1. I think that's what's going to happen. They should beat them, you know, so I hope I'm not, like, jinxing the jinx, but come on to Brentford. And then we get to Super Sunday, where we've got Liverpool, who are joint top with Arsenal, hosting Brighton. And this is the first game that we'll have seen Jurgen Klopp since spitting the dummy out and getting eliminated out of the FA Cup by Man United. And this is a game where Jurgen Klopp has already announced he's leaving at the end of the season. You know he wants to cement his legacy with another victory. Yeah, I know they've won the League Cup, whatever. He wants to win the Premier League. He wants to try and win the Europa League. He wants to win as much as possible so that when he bows out as Liverpool manager, he can hold his head as high as possible as delivering a legendary result for being what a lot of people consider a legendary manager. But Roberto De Zerbi's Brighton may have something to say about that. They have not been that convincing this year, but De Zerbi is firmly on the audition table. He is definitely in the frame to replace Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool, and this is a game where he'll want to give a good account of himself. Brighton obviously need the points, want to be successful anyway. Because if a couple of results go Brighton's way, they're very firmly on Man United sales and could be chomping down sixth place. Looking at the top five, which for Brighton is absolutely unbelievable. And with Andy Robertson getting injured for Scotland, the Liverpool defence is very firmly shaken. We've got Conor Bradley at right back, with Gomez at left back, Kelleher in, def uh, in goals. The rest of the team is fairly full strength, but Liverpool don't pretend to defend with a great degree of proficiency anyway. So when they've got a second choice, I know some of these guys have been impressive, like Bradley and Kelleher or whatever, but the second choice guy is all the same. Coming up against first choice guys that are highly motivated and really need the points. This is going to be a game that I think we're going to see both teams score more than once. I can see Liverpool scoring three or four quite comfortably at Anfield on a Sunday, especially considering what the last match is on Sunday, just to really put that pressure on. But I don't think it's going to be easy work. They're not going to be running all over Brighton. Brighton are going to be giving this a good game. They might even take the lead in this match. I think it's going to finish Liverpool 4, Brighton 2. And then we have the final game of the weekend. Manchester City and Arsenal. Pep versus Arteta. Master versus Padawan in a game that is borderline a 12-pointer in the title race. Arsenal neck and neck, of course, with Liverpool, who will be kicking off right before this game, and Man City, who are one point behind, all in the same amount of games. This game is going to be an absolute all-timer for me. Sometimes these real high-stakes, high-profile games can maybe fizzle out, disappoint, and there might not you know, be much action or intensity, but make no mistake about it, both of these teams are going to be trying to win. The players, the managers, everyone is motivated to get one up on each other, and especially when you look at the table, there's no friends here, everyone is out for themselves. The Man City team is almost unrecognisable, Ortega Moreno in goals, Guardiol, Ake and Ruben Diaz is a back three, Kovacic starting in midfield, you know, it's all over the place here, but when you see De Bruyne, when you see Foden, when you see Alvarez, Bernardo Silva, and Erling Haaland up top, it's enough to strike fear into any team. But Arsenal, before bottling the league last year, if you want to call it that, were making a real name for how amazing their defence was when it was full strength and available. And, you know, maybe Kiwi are, it's coming on to a game that now I get it. But what I'm really thinking about here is Gabriel and Saliba. And we've also got Ben White, who's not did any international duty. He'll be fresh and ready to go. But when I'm looking at this game, the big part of this preview that I'm excited to see is Declan Rice and Odegaard in this game. Declan Rice especially after his big money move. This is why you buy a guy like Declan Rice. And I think it's going to be him versus Rodri, Odegaard versus De Bruyne. That midfield battle of the creator, the engine, the, the talisman and Odegaard and, and De Bruyne versus the engine room, the box-to-box, -box, the heart and soul of the team of Rodri and Rice. It's going to be a real interesting battle. It's not quite going to be like Keenan Vieira or anything, don't get me wrong, but I think this might be cl as close as the modern era has came to that kind of on-pitch, like man-for-man, -man, same position, really fighting six pointers for the title. Saka looks to make the game Havertz in the false nine, false Havertz position, whatever we're going to call it. And Trossard probably gets the nod here as well. I think Man City are always good to get two or three goals in a game like this, just with the amount. And Ar Arsenal really need the points more than Man City because you've got to imagine Liverpool beat Brighton and then Arsenal are behind the eight ball coming into this game. 
And Man City love that. You know, they love a team that are going to come out, vacate space, take opportunities, take risks to give them the chance to try and exploit in that. And too, so I can see Man City scoring three goals in this, no problem at all. And it is just going to be a case of can Arsenal match? Can Arsenal exceed them? I'm not so sure. I think at the Etihad, it can be a wee bit more difficult for travelling teams. Not really, maybe necessarily down to the environment from the fans or whatever, but Man City have got a really good home record in these bigger games. I think the goalkeepers are going to make the difference here. And I just prefer Ortega Moreno to have a better game than David Raya. So I'm going to go with Man City to win this game by three goals to two. I hope you enjoyed this one, guys. On screen there now is some other stuff that I've made that YouTube thinks you might enjoy, as well as that full preview of Aston Villa versus Wolves. I hope you enjoy all the football this weekend. If you're out and about for the Easter weekend, have fun, stay out of trouble, and I'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.